Hey everyone, thank you very much for joining us for this global get, get going with uh, Google Admin Console. Um, for those of you who joined us last week, uh, we're just going to uh, go over um, the uh, Google Admin Console again. Um, uh, and this time, uh, Jay and uh, John will be uh, uh, taking over the uh, the main presentation, and and myself and John Gerhardt will be um, in the background. Um, thank you to uh, everyone in the chat. Um, it's great to see um, everyone uh, everyone here. Um, and uh, for those of you who are just joining, uh, please uh, do share with us where where you're joining from, and um, share your Twitter handles uh, in the uh, uh, in the chat, and uh, uh, we'd love for you to all um, uh, connect with us. Um, and uh, you can follow uh, follow us all. We'll, we'll post our uh, we'll post our Twitter handles in the chat. But also, please do follow uh, Global Geg um, on Twitter. It's uh, at globalgeg.org. And then you can also watch all of the sessions uh, that we've run again uh, uh, on YouTube uh, and on the globalgeg.org website. Um, but first, we'll just kick it off with a few uh, introductions. Uh, Jay, did you want to share your uh, I'll put screen in there? Um, so um, I'm uh, I'm Abid Patel. Uh, I'm the uh, IT director at the Leading Learning Trust, which is a multi academy trust or um, our equivalent of districts. Um, uh, in London, um, and I've been uh, working in uh, IT for 16 years now, uh, and managing the uh, G Suite Admin Console uh, since 2017. Um, John Gerhardt, do you want to uh, take it away with your intro? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's John. Um, I'm the leader of GG Switzerland. Uh, I work in IT in an international boarding school in Switzerland. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Stromwasser. I'm a director of technology in New York. Um, I've been in and out of classrooms in the ed tech world for a long time now, and I'm really excited to be here and share my knowledge with all of you and learn from you as well. And hello, everyone. My name is John Mansell Platel. Um, I was, I'm kind of a citizen of the world. I was born in England, raised in Australia, and I now live in Northwest Ohio. Um, and I work for uh, an information technology center, and we serve approximately 100,000 students in 23 counties of Northwest Ohio. Um, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, sharing with you what we know about um, Google Admin Console this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you're uh, uh, watching from. Cool. Thanks, guys. Right. So uh, John Gerhardt and I will be uh, behind the scenes and, and we'll be uh, chiming in on the chat. But uh, for now, uh, we'll leave it over to uh, Jay and John to take it away. Great. Well, thanks so much, Avid. And I was going to say, we're just going to tag team here. So there might be a little bit of a gap between each of us talking. But um, given that we're in different parts of the world, uh, I'm sure you can understand. So just to go over some of the training aims that we're going to be following today, we're going to be talking about the you know, admin console, ultimately what it is, where you find it, what is the general you know, ethos of the console, and you know, the, what kind of a interface and navigation is possible. We're going to show you the structure of the console and how you can make some changes and what are some suggested ways to do that. And we'll be doing that a little bit in the deep dive. And then ultimately, um, we're going to go through some of the core G Suite apps, and it's all dependent on your questions and uh, how we can help you from there. So part of this training is going to give you some time to take a look at the admin console from kind of a bird's eye view. Um, but please, please, please give us questions, throw them in the chat. Um, you know, we have a great team of people behind us. Uh, from the GEG global team, and they're giving us all the information that you're bringing into the chat. So please bring that out. And then ultimately, just a reminder, it's an overview. So if there's anything else that we can help you with, please give us the feedback. And we're hoping to have more of these deep dives in the coming uh, weeks. So as a G Suite administrator, ultimately, you're going to the Google Admin Console for everything. You're going to be able to manage all of your G Suite uh, services. You're going to create your users, manage your billing, setting up devices, and a lot more. 
and we've given you a little bit of a link here and we'll show, share the slide deck with you as well so you can look at it on your own time. The admin console is only available to administrators, what they call super admins or administrators that have certain limited admin responsibilities. So you would always be able to get there by admin.google.com or if you use the waffle icon, you can actually look for the um, green admin uh, logo, which we'll show you shortly. So just an overview of what the dashboard looks like, and I'm actually gonna dive straight into my real admin console. So what I was talking about before was the waffle. And if you notice, you scroll down, it's like a greenish blue. There's your admin console for everyone to see. So when you're in here, as many of you may see, this is a completely blank structure. Uh, I just recently got some my training domain fixed and I'm able to get back into this to show you what yours would look like if you have nothing in it as well. So we're gonna start together. And I wanna actually show you that this is the admin console dashboard. But what's nice about it is that you can go through all of these things. And since Google built search, you can also search for anything you're looking for as well. And you're gonna find that search feature very handy because um, some of the settings are buried quite deeply down inside of the admin console and um, it's very difficult to remember where they all are, but you can search for them, which makes it a lot easier. All right, so we're just gonna start from the top. You know, when, I, when I'm training, I'm always talking about the top down. And so really everything is based on this dashboard. If you click on this dashboard icon, you'll see relevant information about your organization. You have your users tab, which is where you would create or you manage any of your users, create and manage in groups, organization units, or also known as OUs. A lot of us use that terminology, so that's just what you might hear. Buildings and resources, this is where you would actually be able to manage um, Google calendars for resources. Devices, this is where your Chromebooks, your mobile devices would be living. Apps, this is how you actually add apps so that the users don't have to do it themselves. You can force enable or force block certain apps using this, as well as all the G Suite core apps, which we'll go through as well. Security, reports, billing and company profile, and admin roles. And I'm just gonna scroll down a little bit, show the rest, which is domains. And this is where you would go in there to uh, manage any of your domain settings. Data migration, if you're gonna migrate from a different tool, rules and support. So that's really a total bird's eye view of everything that we were talking about in the beginning. So we're gonna start with users. Now what's important about users is that when you create an, a user, you wanna make sure they have a place to go. So if you notice, I have a couple of users here. But when I click on add new user, it's going to ask me where I want it to ultimately go. So wherever I put all my information here, I can change the organization unit. And right now, because this is my bare bones account, I only have one. So I'm gonna skip out of this one second and go back to my admin console dashboard and go to organization units. So if you notice, I only have a top root organization. But if I click on the little plus button over here, I can create another OU and I'm gonna call it staff and create that underneath. And this is a good idea to have a hierarchy of all of your um, organization units. If you give it a second, it should automatically be here. I'm gonna refresh the page. There we go. So the first thing I wanna do is add a user into my staff. I'm going to go back to my main area admin and click on users. And this is where I can actually choose. So if you see on the side here, I have my EdTechJ root organization and I have my staff organization. I'm gonna go into staff to add the person into staff and add a new user. And I'm just gonna put some information in here. I'm gonna automatically generate a password and I'm gonna ask for them to automatically uh, 
change the password at next sign in and add the one user. thing to note on that screen jay is that uh, if you have more than one domain you can actually choose which domain you want that um email address that you essentially just created to be from that's true you could do that so a lot of times you might want to share this to a person's um personal email you could do that under more actions email the login information and you can email it directly to wherever you want to or print it and you can actually you know give it to them on paper to prevent for any kind of um uh, going against the, you know i'm going to click done here so my first user is actually created under staff it's being a little slow so i apologize I'm not sure why it's not showing up, but just to let you know, it is still there. <laughs> okay. It's also worth noting that you need organizational units for your devices. Correct. So John, do you want to talk a little bit about groups? Okay. Uh, Google Groups is, uh, it, it fulfills a couple of roles, but there are some um, organizational things for example, there is a group called Classroom Teachers that you need to know about, and it is the one that members of that group have the ability to create classes in Google Classroom. And if you click on the group's tile there, it will take you in, and that's actually um, the one that has been created by default here. So um, if you go into that, uh, we could make any teachers in our domain then members of that group. And then uh, those settings, when we look at uh, Google Classroom, later on in the app, under the app style uh, it would be a reason for example that a teacher is unable to create a class in Google classroom would be that they're not a member of this group so this is one of the groups that gets created automatically but you may also if you have email distribution groups they would also belong in here and you can create um, groups for communication purposes as well exactly so what I've gone ahead and done is added a classroom teacher into the group and Google's just being a little bit slow right now, but it is showing up as a test staff member and that's exactly what the email is. So if I logged into that account, I'd have access to classroom to be able to create. It's important to know that if students were to do that, they wouldn't have the ability to even become a teacher. But if they do, you just go into classroom teachers and remove them from there. We could talk about that in a, in a future session where we actually restrict this option from everybody. John, do you want to talk about apps? Yeah, sure. Let's go and look at them underneath apps. And they this is an area that has expanded over the years. Uh, it used to be when we got in here, I think there was, I, th I think there was three tiles and then they added a fourth and now they have a fifth. But you're going to find and really the best way to differentiate between them, and you can see there it says uh, the G Suite has 14 services and the additional Google services has 51. The difference between them is essentially uh, to do with the, uh, the user agreement that you sign and which um, Google supports uh, only certain apps underneath that user agreement. And those were the ones under the G Suite there. So if we click on that, um, we can see that these are some of the main apps that will show up in the waffle menu when you're looking uh, in your account and indeed uh, if and these are all on for everyone right now but if we were to turn some of those off then they will no longer appear in the waffle um, but if you can do this uh, turning off and turning on for everyone in the domain or you can do it just specifically for your staff or for your students. So if you wanted to restrict your students, say, and not give them access to uh, chat, then you can you would turn that off for their organizational unit, but you would have it on for the staff organizational unit. So if we back... And that's back exactly up. what I made that change right here. So if you notice, at the EdTechJ root level, the service is off, but at the staff level, the service is on. One thing also to take note of is if you make a change at this point, uh, there is a save button in the bottom right hand corner there. And it's a little inconsistent across the interface, but you need to always make sure that there is not a save button that you've missed because you could change screens and uh, have not saved that change and then wonder why it didn't work. 
Exactly. Important to know. And it's also important to know that this is exactly where you would go under your course suite services if you're concerned about certain settings. So for example, calendar. You can change the sharing settings that all, all the uh, members of your organization would be applicable to. So you can actually force them on or for, force them off depending on how you wanna do it. This is where you would create your resources that would be uh, school-wide, for example, laptop carts or lab classrooms, and you get insights once that information is being used. So it's really important to use all of the different start settings within and click around and you know just play because you can't really break it. And if you do, there's always an undo button. And if not, we'll show you how to get support. So another important place to go and just to talk about in general is, and again, reminder, this is just a bird's eye view of everything, is devices. Now, again, I'm on a test domain, so I don't have any devices. However, this is where you would actually be able to add your Chrome devices based on the purchasing that you've done. You'd be able to add mobile devices. So based on students or staff members that request access to use their mobile devices, you'd have control over here as well as manage browsers. And manage browsers would allow you to have settings as long as the person is signed into Chrome. If you notice, my uh, head over here is actually signed in as well as the one over here. John, yeah. anything else you want to add about um, the I, overall I would, area? I would say uh, generally the, the overall, uh, when, when you are dealing with uh, device settings themselves, there are relatively few settings that you actually have to do with the device itself. Most of it is all followed around by the actual Google account. So the, uh, the account-based settings on devices control things like uh, who can log into the device and what domain that they can be from and uh, things like that, what network, um, things like what network the device is going to connect to when it first um, uh, when it first signs in, those are determined in the device settings. But as I said, there are f relatively few device settings, but there are quite a lot of user-based settings. And those will bleed over into uh, like browser settings, uh, whether you are force installing apps, those kinds of things uh, all come underneath the, the, the user accounts rather than the devices themselves. Exactly. And again, Google built search. So one of the nice things is that you can actually search here. So if you're looking for something about maybe whitelisting, that would actually give you the information about where you would actually do that. What safe browsing whitelisted domains, or you wanted to know about the avatar and you'd be able to change that right from here. So again, it gives you a lot of the options within the, the filters that are built into the search bar at the very top. Great. So we're just gonna go into company really quickly, just to give you a, an understanding of what that really is. So the company profile is where you would go to make any changes about your organization. So this is where you could actually um, look at your company name, the language, the time zone. You know, time zone is important if you are a worldwide company and dealing with this. Um, some of us may remember from some of those exams we took where you have to worry about time uh, time zone features. Communication preferences, how you wanna actually, as a, a domain administrator, receive information, updates, account information, anything related to how you set up your account and your data storage, as well as legal and compliance, creating custom URLs and account management. What, one thing so I'll mention- You go in very often. <laughs> One thing I mentioned in there, Jay, is um, you have two options for your domain. It can be a, um, an, what is it, an early release domain, or it, it, which affects um, how quickly changes are made when they introduce new changes to the, uh, the there's a rapid release domain is, is one kind, and I think it's a, a scheduled release. So right. for example, um, Google Groups, is getting update and they just announced that in an email, I think it was this morning, and uh, they talked about the uh, the rapid release demands are going to be getting that feature, I think uh, the first week of June, and then usually the scheduled release will get those two weeks later. So uh, if you have a training domain, sometimes it's a good idea to have it on a rapid release, that way you get access to the features before everybody else and you can kind of train on them. 
And an important thing to notice is every time you make a change, make sure you also hit the save button. You know, so if you were to do automatic and you want everything to happen at every time and rapid, you would click save. And it does take time, even if you make this change, that you become that domain, uh, whether it's rapid or scheduled, if you weren't before. So it's important to know that as well. And any time that you see any release information that Google has and they have uh, a blog uh, where they do all of the scheduled release um, information and uh, that comes into your email, uh, it, will it will reference whether... Um, uh, what impact that's going to have on you as an administrator. So it will tell you things that you need to do. So, for example, the Google, uh, the changes to um, to Google Groups are going to be on by default, which means that you really won't need to do anything other than maybe let your users know that the interface for Groups is going to change slightly um, and then to help them prepare for that transition. Correct. So we're going to go into security next just to give you a, a little bit of background, again, an area that you're not going into too often, as long as you set it up properly. Up, oh, I got logged out. My apologies. So just to know if this ever happens to you, which it happens to all of us, is a 15 minute timeout if you are in the middle of a session, it often happens. <laughs> and we should be back in a second. So again, apologies, we are live, things do happen. Jay, whilst we're waiting. Jay. So security is where you would actually enforce your two-factor authentication. You'd get alerts about what's going on in your domain. You can set up rules and activities to see if something seems a little off, someone creates an account or someone deletes an account without realizing. <clears throat> your password management, so you could set how long you want your passwords to be, um, enforcing strong passwords, uh, making sure that there are a certain length, minimum and maximum. And again, if you're going to allow password reset, reuse or not, as well as expiration. So you can really go into here. You're not going in very often to most of this area. However, when you do, it's important to know that you can make some serious changes in here and make sure you know what you're doing if you're going to make any of these changes. Anything you want to add, uh, John? I would just talk about um, if you are a Google admin, especially if, if you're the admin of a school domain, that a recommended best practice is that you do turn on two-factor authentication for uh, system administrators. Uh, it's a good idea to have it on for uh, your regular users, although some of them will object to that. But um, And the idea behind two-step is that when you go to log into your domain, you will then need to be uh, either sent a text message with a six-digit number uh, that you then enter in, and that is the second step of the verification. And it is considered to be much more secure than just having a username and password. And if you look at there's an, another step to this you can turn on enforcement now you can turn it on whenever so you can actually give a heads up to your organization that maybe july 1 you're going to enforce this and at july 1 everybody will get that um a force option to allow for two-step verification and it's important to know when you're doing two-step that all you need these days is just a cell phone uh via text or phone call or some type of a key. They make uh, different kinds of uh, USB sticks with fingerprint and biometrics, and you don't really need that. All you need is a cell phone, a second way to make sure that who is logging in is the right person. So while it's important to know what's going on in your, your account, you don't always have to get emails. So it's important to also look at reports whenever you have a chance. And you're not going to see much in here because it is a bare bones um, domain. But this is where you would actually get aggregate do domain information. How much is useful? As you see, it's walking me through all the different steps. Find out how many weekly active users you have. There's not going to be many in this domain. And if you wanted to ever X out of this, you just click the X on the top here. But it gives you all the information about what's going on inside of your account. 
this is where you can actually pull information about files that might be accidentally deleted. You can bring them back using Vault, which we can talk about at a, at a further deep dive. Uh, it also gives you audit information as to who made changes and what they made changes to. So if you accidentally made a change to an admin setting, you can also go back and figure out what you did and undo what you did. And you could also manage alerts that you do get by email, which they've moved. So if you notice, these are different rules that the uh, organization has actually created. These are all defaulted. I didn't make any of these changes, but it's important to know some of them. Um, and I know that I used in the past the Chrome device uh, activity report. So when I had devices that just seemed to not check in for a while, I knew that maybe I had a problem and I started having to figure out if I had a solution in place to try to track the devices that just somehow went missing. Um, I was able to use this report feature by email. John, anything you want to add to this? Uh, no, I think that's good. So we're going a little fast, um, and we want to make sure that we answer any of your questions. So if there's any questions, please put them into the chat. I definitely want to make sure that uh, you know all of your questions are answered, and we have a whole team behind us that are moderating and helping us. So uh, I see that they're answering a lot of them, but if there's anything else that comes into play, we want to make sure we answer those things. So I'm going to go back to the top. Yep. There was a question on uh, how do you get a trainer domain? Um, did you, um, I know we've talked about trainer domains. So did you just want to uh, just talk about how uh, briefly about the process of Google Certified Trainers and how you can get a training domain? Sure. Um, well, I, I can actually uh, shout out to John Gerhardt, who has been running some training uh, sessions, and he's trying to actually uh, add a few more in the in the mix. But it really is a process. Um, there's a lot of great trainers that are helping out to do that. Uh, Abid and John are two of you know the people that you see in the chat in the forums all the time. But really, most important is actually purchasing your domain and purchasing the right domain. I can tell you when I did it. Uh, things have changed and I actually now have two domains that I own and I'm trying to make sure that I don't have two domains moving forward financially that I have to support. But it is important to have that domain. Um, it's recommended to go with GoDaddy versus going with Google. Uh, there's an easier process and a bid you can speak to that if there's anything else you want to add. Uh, no, I, I would definitely say uh, GoDaddy is probably the simplest uh, option. Um, uh, to, to go for when signing up for the domains. Um, if you already have a, a, a domain registered with Google domains, um, then, you know, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, us on Twitter and we can, um, uh, we can assist you with um, setting, setting that up in the, uh, in the background. Um, uh, just going through some of the uh, other uh, points in the chat, there were loads of points, uh, great points being made. Um, uh, Rachel's made this great point about two-step verification. I think, um, in in the in the world we live in right now, um, uh, we see so many organisations get having their um, uh, credentials um, uh, hacked, and um, it, it's really really important uh, to set up two factor authentication. Um, uh, Jay, you mentioned the um, the the Ubico uh, sort of verification keys. Uh, you can also use the uh, Google Authenticator app. Um, and you can also do uh, SMS text message as well um, for two-factor authentication. And um, uh, another question we had was just about um, switching on and off some of the uh, G Suite services. Um, did you just want to mention how, uh, for example, sure. uh, uh, you can how you can control G Suite services uh, depending on OUs um, and, and why it's important to set up uh, OU structure as well? Sure. So, um, you know, we started, obviously, I have a bare bones account, so I don't have as, as much in here, but um, I would actually have a staff account, a student account, a device, um, not account, I'm sorry, a level of my hierarchy so that I can actually have everything set up by certain user groups. And so if you just click on staff, for example, and I wanted to make sure that staff had Gmail, I want to click that setting. And inside of Gmail, maybe I want staff to have the ability to email out, but I don't want students to be able to email out. This is where I would make a lot of those changes. 
So while you can turn on the entire service, you could also turn on parts of the service based on OUs and based on group settings. Does that answer that question? Yeah, um, I think so. Um, yeah, everyone, please uh, please keep your uh, questions coming um, in the chat, and um, uh, we'll come back to some uh, some more questions later on. But um, uh, back over to you guys. Jay, do you want to go back to um, devices for a second? I just thought of a, sure. a, a, couple, a couple of things to mention. Uh, when you buy Chromebooks or um, Chrome boxes, and I don't believe Chrome bits are, are being um, released anymore, although we, uh, at our organization, we use Chrome bits as um, uh, digital signage. So we actually have them just plugged into the HDMI port on a big screen TV, and that is our digital signage. But the way that those are managed, again, is through the admin console. So when you buy uh, a device, you have to buy a license to control that device. Uh, and you buy that from a, a third-party uh, reseller. So in the in the states here, uh, CDWG and some of the other vendors um, will sell you the Chromebook, but they'll also also send you uh, sell you the licensing. And uh, the licenses will show up um, if you're in this area, and you will see that you have um, any um, if you have any devices or licenses available that um, this will then not be grayed out. And when you go into it, it will say that you have, if you say you buy a hundred Chromebooks uh, with a hundred licenses, it'll say that there are, uh, there are a hundred licenses available. And so uh, you basically enroll the device in the domain and that enrollment process then uses up one of those licenses. Um, they, you can also unenroll devices. Uh, so managing and knowing how many licenses and devices you have is an important part um, of managing uh, the domain. And uh, in the example that I gave of our digital signage, uh, we actually have uh, those Chrome bits, again, are managed in the Chrome management section. And we actually turn on and enable or will force install an app that's called the kiosk app. And the kiosk app, um, all it really actually does is um, it, 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 for, it forces this, the, uh, you have a kiosk app in here, and it forces the, uh, the, the browser to open up and to, in, in our case, we're using an app called Chrome Sign Builder. And, uh, but we would manage all of that from inside of the admin console. So all of the settings for how we want the sign set up are, are all policies that we do for the organizational unit that that particular uh, device has been joined to. So it's it's possible to manage all of your devices with these organizational units, and you can get really quite granular with the way uh, that that is organized. So for example, you can have uh, a Chromebook set up so that if it goes from one building to another, it takes on a different set of policies when it gets to the other building. Uh, and people can get really quite um, fancy with the way that that works. But it is, that's a very uh, deep area. And it's one that we could look at in a deep dive is um, managing devices, uh, force installing applications, extensions, managing all of that user experience on Chromebooks, which uh, have become certainly in the United States, a big part of uh, the uh, the school experience in the Google based schools. And to your point about networks, that's where you would actually add your um, Wi Fi networks and your VPNs that you are um, in charge of. So that again, as you were talking about from going from building to building, the device doesn't lose the connection, and you don't actually have to um, type in any passwords. So one recommendation I've used in the past, and that was uh, provided to me by Google support was actually having an unencrypted network just to be able to get to the enrollment screen. And once I got into the enrollment screen, as soon as the person signed in with their account, it actually would take over. So you would create your Wi-Fi network at the top level. And then when the device hits um, you know, the right uh, user group, all of a sudden the, the Wi-Fi would change over to the personal Wi-Fi, uh, whether it be a staff Wi-Fi or a student Wi-Fi, so that your restricting, your filtering is properly set up. Another use of OUs might be uh, if you have students that are not uh, following directions, imagine that um, in your school and you need to put them on a timeout or give them less access to the internet, then you can create an organizational unit for that particular device. And when you move uh, the Chromebook from uh, its, its 
original organizational unit into this new one, it will then pick up the policies policies for that and restrict them. So it might be that you're, uh, you have chat turned off and you have um, a whole lot of things turned off. Uh, and in some schools, until a student signs an acceptable use policy, uh, they have a very restricted access to the internet. So that would be another use of organizational units within the devices area. That's right. And again, I wish I could show you guys a little bit about what is in the Chrome device, but since I'm in a, uh, a, a trainer domain without any Chrome devices, we're limited on what we can show here. But in a future deep dive, that's something we can go forward. Uh, there's a lot to go about Chrome devices, uh, whether you're using standard Chrome books, Chrome boxes, as you were talking about, but also there are certain devices that can function like a Chromebook. Um, there are some companies out there that are creating devices that give you permissions on the Chrome level and Chromium level. Uh, you'd also make all those changes within here as well. And again, because I have nothing in here, I can't click and show you, so I apologize. And I don't know if uh, if Abid has any comments on this, but, but uh, I, I saw a comment in the chat uh, that they're interested in the Chrome Sign Builder. Uh, Google is in the process of kind of migrating their apps over to a, a different platform, and I'm not fully up to date with what that's going to look like, but um, I know that it is going to be changing that particular app, Chrome Sign Builder, while it's free, it ha really hasn't received very many updates. And so uh, it, it works for the most part, but I'm not sure what we're going to do. Um, and they haven't really given us an indication. Uh, it's a fairly specialized area of um, uh, that some schools want to use. And uh, But I'd be happy to share uh, my expertise um, with anyone that is interested in learning Sign Builder because uh, for the cost of a device, it can be quite a lot cheaper than using some of the uh, $30 a month signage solutions that are out there. Thanks, John. Um, I've left, uh, I've just posted a link to our feedback form in the chat. So um, I know a few people have said that they're, they're, they'd be really interested in learning more about the um, uh, the, the Chrome Sign Builder. So um, if you are interested, then please please do leave us uh, the, those comments on, uh, on the feedback and um, we'll look at arranging something else soon. Let's talk um, just briefly um, about the, uh, the, the the support button there. Um, if you go into the support area, that's something I'd have to say that the support that Google has uh, that is available once you go into that area, if you're having a problem with something in there, and sometimes uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter whatever you do, you will end up um, running into a problem and uh, uh, using Google support mechanism um, and you can get into a chat with one of their uh, technicians and you can usually get um, most of those problems resolved fairly quickly and they're very responsive and I would definitely recommend uh, you using that feature. It's something that is um, built into every uh, training domain um, and something that you should take advantage of. So for some reason, I don't know why, but it's not letting me even get to the support group. I'm wondering if it is because I'm a trainer domain, but I'm going to uh, take a second to refresh and hopefully it'll come back. Nope, not giving, not giving me the option, <laughs> but I agree. I think that the support feature is really helpful. Um, if you are actually using, uh, I know Android and, and I know iOS has the ability to have a support I'm sorry, an, an admin app, there's actually a support that's built into there. So there's been plenty of times that I've been on a cell phone call um, on the road, talking to Google support, they're looking at my domain and I'm just giving them the feedback of what I'm looking for them to do, help me to do. And then at the end, they give you a great recap email, exactly what you're looking for. And if there's any follow-ups, they always do follow up within uh, a great time. Um, and I do have to say, the chat is definitely the fastest feature, but I do find the phone is a little bit more personal. Uh, Jay, I can I can pop on and and share my screen if you want me to show the uh, support. Sure. Yeah. 
So um, here's the uh, uh, here's my trainer domain admin console. So um, I've I've never actually uh, clicked on this uh, the support button here from the uh, dashboard here, but uh, what it does is it pops up uh, in a separate window um, in the same screen. Or what I just tend to do is press the uh, uh, icon um, in the top right hand corner here next to the waffle. Uh, and so if you just click on that, it pops up in the screen. And so then you've got the uh, help assistant that pops up. So there's a few things that it will do. It will give you some of the most uh, most uh, currently searched for uh, um, articles to, to help you with. Um, so set up meet for distance learning, for example, and it'll take you through uh, some of the basics there. You can then just click on this window and then it will just pop up into, uh, into a separate window. Um, or what you can do is you can go further down and then you can either search directly for help here. Um, you can search what you want to search for, uh, or you can click on the option to contact support. And then uh, contact support, um, like Jay said, uh, you've got the uh, the chat function, um, which uh, will give you um, an instant um, messaging chat um, style that you can chat and ask for help. You can also email, and then you can also phone. Um, when you when you click on phone, um, it'll ask you what you want help with, uh, and then what it will do is it will um, just um, uh, it will give you some options. If it didn't give um, if if it didn't help, then uh, simply press this button that says this didn't help. Continue to support, and then as soon as you press that, it will give you some phone numbers uh, and a, and a pin code. So when you phone up the uh, the number, you'll get um, uh, you'll, you'll get an automated reply that says. Um, uh, please enter your PIN code. Once you've done that, uh, it will then give you some options to transfer you over to a to a specialist. Um, and uh, the important thing to know is that um, uh, Google support is available to everyone who has a G Suite domain uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the support covers uh, everything that is listed in the G Suite core apps. So all of these, um, uh, all of these uh, apps that you see here are, are the G Suite core apps, and they're all uh, covered uh, by the um, G Suite uh, service agreement. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, if there's, uh, it, it's a really great uh, support uh, option. Um, if you are ever stuck with anything, um, and and you know, th there's been plenty of times where I've come across um, issues in the in the admin console. Um, and um, that, that, that's a great place to go. Uh, and, and if there's something that you need further help with, then the, the Google support team will also do a screen sharing session as well with you. So you can actually show uh, and you can go through um, some of the uh, uh, some of the issues um, in, in greater detail. Um, one thing also that I, I wanted to mention was all of these core apps and services are all uh, compliant with all of the uh, regulation, uh, local country regulations. So uh, here in Europe, they are fully GDPR compliant. In uh, in the USA, I know they are all copper, SIPA, FERPA client uh, compliant, and they also meet all of the ISO uh, twenty seven thousand and one um, uh, regulations. So um, uh, it's it's really um, uh, good to. Um, uh, to know that all of your um, documents and data and and the stuff that you do in G Suite is is completely safe um, from that perspective. Uh, thank you, Abid. Cool. Um, and, any... and I do want to say there was definitely a bug on mine because I'm still not able to do it uh, <laughs> to even show you what what happened. But thank you for uh, thank you for the back end and and the te and the teamwork here. Cool. Um, uh, I'm just going through the uh, the questions and um, uh, comments um, uh, to see anything uh, if there was anything that um, yeah uh, something that Catherine asked. So um, when uh, when she's created a uh, a user account for a member of staff um, like you showed. Um, I think John answered the question in the chat, but um, basically it was just a case of uh, there's multiple ways to give them their credentials. So I think you can um, uh, you can ask a question to uh, uh, to basically say 
um, uh, sorry, you, you can select the option to um, give them the username and password. You can also email them their username and password. You can also email them a link and then they will get a link that is valid for 24 hours with mm -hmm. a, and that link will basically take them to uh, a Google page that will ask them to create a, a password. Um, and, and also one thing to remember with password, uh, uh, passwords on G Suite is that uh, they have to be a minimum of eight characters. Uh, I think you can have a maximum length of a hundred characters. Um, I'm still yet to come across someone who set a hundred character uh, password, but um, uh, that's a fun fun tidbit to know there. But um, yeah, uh, that's um, uh, basically some of the uh, options when when you're creating um, uh, when you're creating user accounts. Um, just trying to see if there's uh, anything else. Um, so one one question I saw, I, I forgot who it was, uh, was talking about managing Chrome devices and, and moving them. If you set up OUs and you have different Chrome devices in different OU structures, as you move the devices, they would get different permissions, they would get different uh, policies, and it's important to set those up the same way you would setting up a teacher and a staff domain. Uh, it's helpful, again, if you're going to be assigning devices to different people and different organizations or different uh, offices around the world. I can um, I can share my screen um, uh, and I can show my actual work domain um, uh, where we've got some devices. So um, uh, we, 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 we will be looking at doing some further sessions where we go into more deep dive of, of, of devices. Um, uh, and 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 the things that you can um, uh, do, and and then also some of the other features um, and services within within G Suite. But um, if you take a look at devices, for example, here, these are all of the options that you have um, for uh, the devices that are uh, oh, that's the wrong one. Oh, Chrome devices. To to answer Kimber's question. Um, non-chrome devices uh, generally uh, your control is on the user account and um, what services or google apps they will have access to uh, you really don't have as much granularity as uh, what a bid's about to show us here in, in the actual uh, managed chrome devices so you can see these are all of the devices that i have um, within my organization and um, when you uh, when you enroll a chrome device um into the uh into your domain uh, and i always forget what the key code uh is i think it's control alt and e uh, yeah, you don't need to do that anymore actually it's automatically going to be um happening as long as you buy it from a, a reseller it it will actually prompt you immediately to go to the enrollment screen these days which is very very handy <laughs> for sure uh, if you're especially if you're doing hundreds of devices <laughs> yeah uh, and i've made that uh, mistake in the past where i've forgot to do that and signed in and then what you have to end up doing is uh, do a power wash on the chromebook and and start again uh but uh th that would be very handy but um for those who haven't had that yet it uh, is control alt and e and then you enroll that device uh onto onto your g suite domain uh you do need to ensure that you have um uh, the uh, the what was formerly known as the chrome management license and it's now called the uh I think it's called the Chrome um, Education Upgrade. Uh, that that's what will allow you to um, uh, control um, the Chrome devices uh, from the Google Admin Console. But uh, from what uh, the the question was is how you can move. So when you enroll the devices, uh, they will get added to the top level domain. And you can see here on my on my school domain, I've got I've got loads and loads of OUs. If I wanted to move this particular Chromebook uh, to a different OU. I would just click on move select devices and then I can uh, scroll and then select whichever OU I want and then I can click on move uh, uh, and that will move it into that domain, uh, that, that OU. And so uh, what you'll see is um, if there are different settings on, on the top level OU and there are different settings here, then um, those, uh, are, those are the settings that will start to apply. You can also um, disable selected devices, so it's really handy if, if a particular Chromebook goes missing. Uh, you can just uh, tick this box and then click on disable selected devices. Uh, 
and then what will happen is you, you'll get a uh, the device will show this message that you have here which you can customize in the in the settings and then what will happen is that um, uh, so long as force in re-enrollment is enabled um, then that device will never work for anyone ever again uh, no matter how many times they um, uh, power wash it um, and it's a it's a great security feature um, to be aware of um, uh, in in the admin console um, uh, so it's really really handy um, from that perspective great cool um, just looking um, if there's uh, any other so, so there's a question a bit um, about replying all to an email if that could be turned off and um, that's something I, I I'm curious about as well uh, reply all um, that might be somewhere in the uh, Gmail uh, settings deep down. Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'll bring John into the chat. And um, uh, I don't know if John's aware of that one. Um, I've, uh, since uh, I've seen the, the uh, post in the chat, I just did a, uh, a quick search. As far as I can see, there isn't any way to turn off reply to all for a whole domain. As somebody's already mentioned, you can turn it off as a, as a user. Uh, inside Gmail, you can decide that you know it's annoying and you don't want to do it by accident. But I can't see any way. I've, I've been through the Gmail settings for my chain of domain. I can't see any way to turn that off. Uh, and I would just add um, that if you're in a group setting, there are group settings like posting and replying all. So that might be the way that you could do it. But it wouldn't work for just a standard group email. Uh, I'm sorry, standard contact list email. It would have to actually be an official group. Um, and that's something we can go into a deep dive as well. Just had another question there from uh, Guzman. Is is it possible to manage Windows devices other than Chromebooks, um, iOS, and Android from the admin console? Um, it's not something that I've done personally. I know that there is a limited iOS and Android management option, um, but um, uh, there isn't the option to... Um, as far as I'm aware, to manage Windows devices? I don't believe there is. No. Um, we, uh, the, actually, um, having said that, I know there is something coming to um, G Suite uh, edu uh, edu uh, Enterprise for Education um, uh, domains that will enable uh, Windows um, management. Uh, it's just something that I remembered. Um, uh, I'll see if I can find the, the link on that, but uh, that that is coming to uh, G Suite Enterprise for Education, which is a uh, which is a paid uh, alternative to the standard G Suite for Education, and that will allow uh, for um, uh, a certain amount of um, uh, management of Windows devices. Um, I know that um, uh, Ollie Trussell, who's a who's who's a member of the uh, Google for Education team, uh, did a training session. Um, I'll try to find a link to that um, where he briefly went through some of the uh, some of the options uh, on uh, on the uh, uh, how to manage Windows um, Windows devices from um, from the uh, uh, Google Admin Console. Um, but it is it is a nice feature. But again, it, it's one of the uh, the paid for features. So um, I know in this uh, I know in the states there are some districts that have got. Uh, G Suite Education for, uh, Enterprise uh, Licensing, um, uh, and if they have, then that's something uh, that your IT teams might be uh, interested in looking into. Uh, but I know from a trainer domain perspective, um, we wouldn't tend to have that. Cool. Um, okay. I think um, uh, unless you guys have got um, anything else to add, um, uh, I think that pretty much wraps us up. Um, please do uh, leave us feedback. Um, uh, we we really do um, uh, value the feedback, uh, and we use it to uh, shape up um, the, any future sessions that we um, we are delivering. Uh, I'm going to uh, bring um, Stephanie Howell uh, into the uh, chat, um, and she's going to briefly talk about um, an option that we've got with. Um, uh, uh, what we are some events that we've got coming uh, forward, including a level one uh, boot camp. 
You get both of the Stephanies. We're going to do this, so you guys better be ready. Um, well, hello, Global GED friends. Uh, that was a great session. I definitely learned a lot, and I really hope we can turn off the reply all on emails. That would be awesome. I will, I will await that goodness, yeah, to hear somebody's ha happy update. Okay, but here is, yeah, Stephanie has just put up the, the boot camp. So um, there is so much here, and we've been hearing um, great feedback from everybody about this. We had so many signups after we kind of soft posted it, I would say, like almost a soft launch. We just started to send it out, and then it went out like wildfire. I think this is a real need. But when I think about who is coming here to this session today, I would say if you're coming here for an admin console session, then you're probably you're likely someone who might want to be sending this out to your own teams or staffs mm -hmm. um, that you have others who are interested. If you're always getting questions about level one, then send it to all of those people and encourage them to come. And I would also say you could come as someone, I know for me, attending these will help me think about how do I want to teach it to my staff and what are ways that I could learn that could encourage more and more people to want to gain these skills. There are so many things that I've been learning just from the way that Stephanie does some trainings and reaching out and the way to kind of get people excited about learning something new. So I didn't know if you want to talk about any of that stuff stuff that yeah and with the boot camp i just got off of a call this morning with adam um he is a big gamified guy <laughs> he is creating our leaderboard and i think he was a part of um i don't know something 18 i think lax so he is creating our amazing leaderboard for this boot camp so if stephanie didn't pump you up then i hope the leaderboard in that competition will um, I'm pretty competitive, but I don't know if I'm allowed on the leaderboard. What do you guys think? <laughs> I, think I think we might have to ixnay Steph from the leaderboard, but maybe we'll have to have our own internal leaderboard just so that she could always be on top of that. To help her absolutely, absolutely not. <laughs> There's a chance that you could win. I won't be a part of the Global GED boot camp, um, but I will be presenting. And so we've got three days. Yes, all three days are different. They're not the same session. I've been getting a lot of emails. Are they the same? No, day one covers certain um, GC tips and tricks. Day two is more of like the docs and the slides and the sheets. And then day three is like classroom sites, all of that. So all three days. We really tried to think about how to make them a family, like how to group things <laughs> together. And that was the other thing that I think helped. And just FYI, each training, each of those bullet points is being run by by different groups or pairs of amazing trainers, innovators, and other people who are really learned in this um, and really want to share that message. Some of them are also um, level one and or level two certified, but have a really great um, understanding of how to apply it. So I think we're going to be talking not only about um, how, how the tool works, how to help you prepare for the exam, but then in thinking about then how might you use these? And then some of the ways that we'll ask you to do that in terms of the gamification will also help you kind of get yourself out there in terms of tech use, maybe even posting something on Twitter if that isn't the way that you've worked before. But like getting yourself into this world of how do we work in a digital realm? How do we learn from other people? How do we provide great professional development virtually? And I think this will give us a model for that that you can share out as well as really help people with this skill building. Yeah, and every session is about 30 minutes long. So if you only want to attend Gmail, you can. Um, we're going to send the agenda out closer to the date with the times for each of the different sessions. That way people can attend what they need and what they don't need. All sessions will be recorded. So if you're going on vacation or you're going somewhere else, um, feel free to watch the recording if you need to or if the time doesn't work. And then don't forget that. So that's happening um, every, it's every Friday, as long as it's a Friday in your time zone, mm -hmm. I'm assuming. So it's every Friday. What's listed on here is um, EDT. So you can convert it to your time zone um, if you need to. We have this as, um, if you're not a part of our group, let us know, but you can change it. It was made in Google Art to fit your time zone, or you can, when you tweet it out, you can just make the edits up there. Um, but also keep in mind that every Monday following, so the subsequent Monday following each of these sessions, there'll be office hours that are done at two times of the 
day to help with different time zones. And that'll be 30 minutes in a Google Meet with um, with some of our session leaders and supporters. And they will be there to answer direct questions and to help people practice. Mm -hmm. There is no cost associated. So this is all free, put on by all different um, people that are a part of Global GEG. The whole point of, um, of GEGs is that we are supporting people at all parts of their journeys with growing with ed tech and that we are doing that with no cost. We are all volunteers and we just want to help people get better. Yeah, and it is free. The only thing you would have to pay for if you wanted is the grad credit, which is just an option because we're offering so many hours that why not get grad credit if you need it. And then if you want to take the test at the end, it's ten dollars so that would be the only cost um but again you do not need to take the test in order to attend this boot camp you can just attend the boot camp to attend so please send this out to your staff um i know a lot of you are probably way advanced in level one so feel free to share this out with anybody and we um, tried very really hard to that i think the goal of having it on those days was to get it in before before july um and then in july we are um we will we're working towards offering something similar for level two if there are those that need to do that and then on thursday um we have an amazing opportunity this is kind of a pre boot camp so this will just be going over the basics of google level one um so it's just kind of a warm-up for what to expect prior to the boot camp. And one of the great things is because we're partnering and supporting so many local GEGs, if you have other events that you think would be worthy to share out beyond your local, let us know and we're happy We're happy to help um, support them or put things up on our channel if, it, if they're resources that would be greater beyond your local audience, just keep us posted. You can find us on Twitter, you can message us and we're happy to help support them. And then just real quick, we have Edu Protocols on Friday. Um, he is John is amazing, and if you want to have a fun session, come join us on Friday. Um, yeah, just not familiar with John Carippo. Um, I'm lucky <laughs> in that he's kind of in my my region, so I often John, if you're ever watching, like I know it feels like I stalk you because I'm at events and I see him in front of me. <laughs> um, when we were able to be at events together, but um, if you're not familiar with Edu Protocols, it it really is a way to give people templates for for ways to do things, um, to conduct things in a classroom, whether it's in person or virtually. And so it would be quite useful. It's useful in trainings as well as um, actually in teaching itself. So I and would it, say it's there, there are protocols that could apply anywhere within education. And it's zero prep. All of his mm -hmm. ideas are very little prep. It's more on the student. So again, this is a great session that you're gonna really enjoy. We are launching shit soon. We haven't really officially launched. So our big party is going to be on Thursday, June 25th. Everybody's Woo! invited to our huge, huge party to celebrate Global GEG and our official launching. <laughs> and then we have every single week, three times a week, Sunday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, we have a Global GEG staff room. This is a time to come together and vent, talk about strategies to get through COVID. And um, these have really helped me think outside of the box. Yeah, and Kat has done an amazing job with organizing these. And then there have been people that kind of step up at each of the different time zones to help support her in that. But she has been a rock star in doing that and, and maintaining. I would say it's it's really been a space where a lot of the people that we see coming to our events have really met a community there. And then they felt excited about joining in other areas. So please go to this. It's a space to get out anything that you're thinking about, feeling about. Sometimes they talk about school and sometimes not. And then if you're thinking about starting a GEG, Georgina has an amazing five-part series. We're at session four. So feel free to re-watch any of those if you're thinking about starting a GEG or becoming a co-leader with somebody that already has a GEG in your area. Perfect. I think, yeah. And then if, if you are... Um, wondering or wanting to sign up for events, if there's anything else you're wondering what's coming soon, check out all of our pages. We have lots, so you can get in anywhere. Well, and we would love to have you if you're not already part of things. Um, and then, yeah, we're a fun group. We'd love to see you. These are these are some of the people that are part of our awesome team. Um, and we can't thank the presenters here today enough for another wonderful session. So. Thank you, thank you. I think people learned a lot. And then um, how are, did we already talk about the other sessions where people are getting some direct hands-on? Did you already talk about that one? Did I miss um, I've just put in the, uh, I've just put in the chat that, uh, or 
banner to say um i know there are a few questions that said um uh, if you need help setting up your uh, trainer domain um because uh, i know that's been a something of real interest um uh, that people are trying to get set up and there might be a um uh, there might be an option there um uh, and i know a lot of people want want support with that so um uh, definitely do uh, sign up at that link uh, bit.ly uh, slash td setup um anything about calendars <laughs> yeah so do not add the crap one we've had a lot of calendar issues calendar thinks i'm a robot due to the amount of people I've been inviting to events and I think- Okay, it is due to her speed. Like, let's be honest, she is so fast. She is faster than a robot. And um, and to be honest, we've had like hundreds and hundreds of signups within a few hours of certain things. And then Steph tries to send them all out and then we reach the max before it seems even possible to reach the max of the thousands of users that you can. So we have had yeah. lots of calendar issues. As a result, what's happened Steph? So don't use the crap one. We had to recreate the calendar since we broke it. <laughs> use the public one. <laughs> um, it's working, but I'm not allowed to add people to our calendars anymore. So we're just gonna send out an email reminder. So please, if you are a calendar user like I am, just add the event yourself or add our calendar to know when things are happening. Um, everything's linked in the calendar. So feel free to use our calendar, but yeah, do not use the crap one. <laughs> Good night. Uh and um, all that's left to say is um, uh, thank you to um, uh, to John, John, and uh, Jay for um, uh, for leading on these sessions. Um, I know uh, there's been a lot of people um, and a lot of interest from uh, people about getting started with the uh, uh, with the admin console, um, uh, and uh, it has been really, really handy um, uh, running these sessions. Um, and uh, yeah, we please again do leave us feedback and um uh we really do um uh we, we we really will be taking all of that stuff on board um but um uh for now thank you and uh, we'll see we'll see you soon <laughs>